Knock, knock. Hello, Internet world. Is anybody out there? It is I, Nelly. And yes, people may, or they are, no, I don't know. Anyway, hello, world. It is I, back from my trips and journeys and my adventures across the waters. So let's give it another try for last month's show, which got cancelled due to all sorts of crazy, stressful and nightmarish reasons. So let's say hello to everybody who is watching. So leave me a comment. Good morning, Robbie and Neshi and Margaret. Leave me a message, everybody who's listening out there, and then I'll know that you're there. So I decided through some urgings from people that druidy goodness is what you're all after. So that's what I'm going to try and mm, talk about eloquently, which maybe the eloquence part may be a bit of a difficulty, but I'll give it a go. Good morning, Sherry. So here we have Mar like Margaret and Neshi and Robin and Sherry. So I'm going to tell you a story, or at least I'm going to try while I itch my beard. Um, you've all heard about Merlin, Arthur, the Knights of the Round Table, but there are many other stories which are out there in the world, but unless you run around in Druid, druidic circles you're much less likely to have heard of them so i thought i would try and do one today like i said while i drink coffee we need that we need lots of that excuse me so i am going to I'm going to tell you the taught story of Taliesin as best I can remember it. And I admit I'm not the greatest storyteller in the world, but I'll give it a go. <clears throat> so, well, before I start, um, later on, if you have questions, we can post them. I'm going to be concentrating more on the story and try to remember it than answering questions and looking at um, comments for the time being. So bear with me and we'll see if I can get through it or not, as the case may be. Who knows? I may just panic and run away. I'm not going to panic and run away, although I might. So anyway, so with this one, don't ask me for any more right now. So <clears throat> are you all sitting comfortably? I'm going to assume so. So then I shall begin. So who, uh, who have we got? We've got Margaret. We've got some people. So there's a few of you there. So. Let's start. Let's go. So, <clears throat> deep in the mountains of Wales, hidden with magic and guarded by dragons and eagles, there is a secret city of druid alchemists called the Ferrect. 
the all that live there are they spend their time their days deepening their skills of magic and exploring in their with their inner vision the the realms of the depths of the sea and other times and civilizations they explore the depths of the earth and the expanses of the cosmos they engage in debate in philosophy and expand their wisdom and they will come later in our story long before the battle of camlan where arthur fell there was a lord and lady who lived in a great castle on the lakes on the shore of lake bala lord tegid he was a he was a bit of a one a bit of a lad wasn't much for staying at home rather to be wandering the countryside hunting and partying with his uh, with his with his uh, bros you know you know the type his wife was Keridwen now Keridwen was not simply his uh, his wife Keridwen carried when is the god is a goddess goddess of the crescent moon and of the harvest although there were there were men as men will who feared her and would claim only that she was a witch and no goddess at all but uh, simply out of fear of a woman who knows herself and her own power. You know the type. So Keridwen and Lord Tegid, they had two children, Cleiwe and Morfran. Cleiwe was the most beautiful of all children in the land. She she was she was bright and happy and a joy and everybody who met her loved her while her brother morfran he he was often whispered about and called a vagthi which means utter darkness as his 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 form was so repulsive and hideous to everyone who saw him he, as much as Cleiwe was blessed with beauty morfran was cursed and caridwen was at a loss to understand why her son was so cursed she loved him anyway as a mother would but she feared for him as he would grow older for where he may go and what he may become and what may, be, may become of him so she decided that she would go and visit the ferret for she knew that they held the secret of how to brew the cauldron of bright knowledge to obtain the arwen the light and inspiration and wisdom that it held 
and she would she would go there she would beseech them for that knowledge to help her baby boy so she left her children in the care of her servants and left for Dina Safaraun, the home of the Ferret. And days passed through nights she slept until finally she arrived at the gates of Dina Safaraun. And some some say some say it was built of crystal and the towers shone like the sun. So anyway, she she approached the door and as she did, it was opened. And she was met at the gates by by a druid who without a word welcomed her in and beckoned her to follow him to the ferret who she come to see. So she beseeched them, she told them of her son and of why she needed the knowledge of the cauldron of bright knowledge. Why she wanted it. So they listened to her and they granted her access to their library where all their wisdom was held. And she sat and she copied, she read, she read, she read the parchments. She found the information and knowledge that she needed and thanking them she left and returned home the instructions were to gather roots and herbs some by moonlight some by sunlight some at dawn some by dusk some by the full moon some by the full and to throw these herbs into a large cauldron of fresh water which would be boiled for a year and a day and once the time had come only the first three drops of the brew were to be given to Morfran for only those first three drops carried the wisdom and bright knowledge that she was seeking. After that, the rest of the brew must be allowed to boil away to nothing and the cauldron be smelted into slag. For the rest of the brew only contained darkness and misery and pain and death so thinking carefully of these instructions first she visited her children to make sure they were safe and they were well looked after by her servants and she went down to the shore of lake bala where she performed a ceremony to the mother and to the great unknown to help her in her quest. And once done, she, vis she visited Gavanan, who was a druid himself, but also a blacksmith. A blacksmith, a druid rather, of, of many years, who knew the secrets of how to call upon the dragons to fire his forge. 
he worked for Lord Tagid for many years in creating weapons for him and his men. So Keridwan knew him and trusted him and knew that he could build her or make her the cauldron that she needed. So she went to him and told him that he, she needed a cauldron wide and deep and that it was to be delivered to a small cottage on the shore of Lake Bala where the cauldron would be brewed. And she went out into the forest to gather the herbs and roots that she needed day by day, month by month. And once all the herbs and roots had been collected and after the cauldron had been delivered, she set to work. But she knew that she needed someone to aid her in the brewing of this cauldron. She needed help. She could not do this alone. She has duties. She has children to look after. So on one fortuitous morning, she came across two figures in the forest, an old blind man. Morda and his assistant Guion, Guion Bach. Morda meaning sea father, Guion little innocent. And Morda, although a blind man, knew who was standing before him. Sometimes those without eyes see more than those who can see clearly. But he knew who stood before him. He knew this was Caridwin, the goddess. And she enlisted their help. She, she asked them to go into the forest to gather wood. She asked them to tend the fire while the cauldron brewed. And this they did. She was careful, though, to tell them not to taste of the cauldron under any circumstances, only to keep the water topped up, and to keep the fire burning for a year and a day. Never to never taste of it. So she left them and this is what they did. As the days and months went by, Guion went out into the forest to cut and gather wood. Morda with his expert who could feel the fire as it blazed and as it died, kept the fire burning just right. And the days went by. They amused themselves with games. Morda spoke of his life and taught Guion the things that he knew. But eventually time passes. And the day arrived when Morfran was to receive the Arwen, the bright knowledge that Caridwen had been seeking for him. For if she couldn't change him, if she could not make him handsome, then she would, she would grant him knowledge and wisdom and poetry and art. So the day arrived. Guion 
uh, Caradwen gathered her children as they were sleeping and took them down to the co cottage. She left them to sleep, Cleiwe peacefully dreaming as always, and Morfran desperately writhing in misery as he always did. And she waited. She waited for the moment to arrive when the three drops of Arwen were to be granted. But eventually even she grew tired and she fell to sleep as she waited. Then Morda could feel the fire dying down and instructed Guion to throw more wood upon the fire to keep the to keep it burning, to keep it blazing. And so he did. And then he threw some more on. And the blaze roared into life. And suddenly the 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 liquid inside the cauldron spread bubbled and sputtered and three drops flew out catching Guion on the hand burning him uh, so instinctively he sucked his hand to take away the burn and in that moment he instantly knew everything all the knowledge and wisdom of all the worlds was his to know. And he'd realized what he'd done. And he looked around him. He saw Caradwen and the children sleeping there. And he knew there was only one thing he could do. He ran. And as he did, there was a great scream from the cauldron as it, and it cracked open. Caridwen awoke with a start and looked around and realized what had happened and was enveloped in a rage. And she screamed that rage in a way that the world had never heard before. She looked for Guion. She saw that he had gone and she leapt up and ran, ran after him. And then the chase began. So Guion was running as fast as he could, but Caridwin was faster. She was taller, she was older, she, she was a goddess, and she knew and she could run. And she 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 got closer and closer and reached out her hand. And as she did so, Guion realized that he also knew the power of transformation. And so he turned himself into a hare and with the speed of a hare, he leapt forward and escaped her grasp. But Caridwen, being a goddess, she also knows the power of transformation. She's known it a lot longer than he has. So she turned herself into a greyhound. And the chase continued through the fields, through the hedgerows and the forest, until they came upon a stream. We on... As he approached the stream, he could, as he as he as he got closer and closer, he got to the edge and he transformed himself into a salmon and swam as fast as he could down the stream. Again, escaped in Caridwen's clutches. Caridwen, she turns herself into an otter and continues chasing. Faster and faster and faster down the stream, closer and closer she gets. As she reaches forward with her mouth to grab and eat Guion, the salmon, 
he leaps up into the air and transforms himself into a wren and flies as fast and as high as he can. As he does so, Keridwen leaps out and transforms herself into a hawk and chases, continues chasing after him. She, there is nothing that will make her stop until she is captured and killed Guion for what, she, what he has stolen from her son. Keridwin as the hawk flies high and high and begins to dive. She sees the wren and she dives down to grasp it and snatch it from the air. And Guion, knowing this, sees, sees, sees a pile of winnowed wheat. And just as Keridwin's talons reach forward to snatch him from the air. He transforms himself into a single grain of wheat and falls into the pile, thinking that there's no way she could ever find him in this. Keridwin lands and turns herself into a great black hen and reaches forth and snatches Guion, the one grain that she wants, and swallows it whole. Feeling satisfied that her vengeance is now taken, she returns to the form of a woman and begins to walk home. Back to her children, back to the cottage. But Guion hasn't quite finished. As she walks, she feels him transform himself once again into a baby within, within her. And she's overcome once again with rage that, she, that he has snatched away the vengeance that she wanted. But she was patient. She was patient. She was going to wait until he was reborn and then she would kill him. So nine months and nine moons pass and the moment for Guion to be reborn arrives. And as he re-enters the world, she, Kerouin looks upon Guion and sees the most perfect and beautiful child that there has ever been born in this or any other world. And sh she can do nothing but fall in love with him. And her anger and her rage falls away and she nurses him. But she cannot be, she knows she is not the one to raise him. That is for somebody else. She knows that there are other journeys for him to take. His destiny lies elsewhere. So she, she takes a leather bag, places him in it, and sews it shut. Carefully, obviously. And again, with great care, she takes it, takes the bag and casts it upon the sea to allow destiny to take, to take Guion where it will. And for nine more months, Guion 
travels in the bag upon the sea, knowing the powers of the sea and the sky, feeling the love of the moon, knowing the gods and the goddesses, his soul traveling between this world and the next, his spirit learning songs and secrets and stories. There was a man called Elfin. Elfin was somewhat of a, you would like to, you could say a disappointment to his father, Lord Garan here. For Elfin could be said to be one of the unluckiest people ever all the things that he attempted and tried and learned generally fell away to nothing but garan here loved his son and wanted to help him as best he can so on the eve of beltane garan here told his told elfin that he was to gather the catch from the salmon weir for it was normally the biggest and best catch of the season and he would earn great money from it so elfin and his servants went to the salmon weir and as they tried the nets they found that they were completely empty and elfin once again cursed his luck this was always the best catch, but when he is his turn, his turn to gather it in, there is nothing. And he was just about to return home. When out of the corner of his eye, he saw a leather bag caught on one of the poles holding the nets. So he waded out into the water and picked up the bag and carried it back to shore. And you could feel something moving around in it. So he took his knife and carefully split the bag open. And inside was a baby. The most beautiful baby that he had ever seen. And he looked he opened the bag and he showed all the people around him. Look, a baby. What a radiant brow. Taliesin. And the baby sat up and said, Taliesin it is, taking, it, taking that as his name. Elfin took the boy home to raise to his wife and they raised him as his own as their own sorry and as the years passed or as each year passed Taliesin grew tenfold in wisdom and knowledge until he was the most celebrated poet bard in the whole of the land And that is the beginning of his story. There you go. Taliesin, he's well worth looking up for yourselves. Um, my apologies, my storytelling talents are not the greatest, I know, but I give it my best shot. So what, have we got any comments? Well, Elise says, I have been here. Where do some of the comments go? I don't know. I'm not entirely sure if I've got any other comments. No, I haven't. So there you go. That is the story of the beginning of Taliesin. What do you think? Um, 
Thank you, Margaret. That's just one story. It is one of the most important ones. Um, the, uh, there's a lot with 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 these stories there's a lot in them that you can interpret in many different ways there there's always oh what do i how do i say it In many ways, the stories that we tell can often be told in different ways for different people, for different audiences, for different effects. While we say many of the same words, the, the way that we tell the story can give it different meanings for different people. And this was quite often the way in the way back when that stories were told for many for all those different we for, for all those different reasons perhaps somebody needed the knowledge that was gathered in them perhaps they were told in a different way for somebody to think differently about their own actions, whether they be servant or lord or druid or magician. Stories were always there to teach us and to guide us, not just to entertain. I suppose the, ent the teaching, the guiding, was accessed through the entertainment. So, uh, yes, that's one of my favourites. I'm going to try and tell you some further stories somewhere along the way. I'll, hopefully my storytelling techniques will get better and my memory will get better. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. It's very kind. Um, so, yeah. But anyway. So, who else is out there? Who have we got anyway? I know there's uh, a few of you out there. Um I'm trying to see. Ah. I'll need to be sitting around the fire. Yes, definitely. The story of Taliesin. Yes, that's the one. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I've got some comments. Um, The Miss of Avalon. Um, it would probably be in the same kind of era. I'll have to look that one up. Um, yeah, shape shifting is a is a it's how do I put this? Shape shifting is is an important element within many of the stories and in life, really. Um, Bards and Druidry, one and the same. Yes and no. In my tradition, the one that I follow and the um, training that I do or am doing, we have different it's all connected. It's all part of the same, but the bard is the storyteller, the 
the musician, the poet, um, and then to the continuing the training in as as an ovate, the healer, and then the druid, who is the the mystic, the magician, the wise man. So they are they are all connected at different levels of learning. Um, in other traditions, they are they are the same. Um, in Ireland, it's uh, the Philae and the Olaf. Uh, the Olaf is the chief poet, and that's a clumsy way of putting it, but I haven't got another one at the moment in my head. And the Philae are the poets, the bards, um, but they have all the knowledge and wisdom and magic as the the druids in wales so that it's all connected and they all intermingled they all traveled so the they are there is a there is a they are the same and they're not but they are all connected it's just different names for different for my tradition different names for different levels of 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 training and knowledge uh i hope that made some sense Um, what else have we got? Oh, if Rob's listening, or if he listens later, I must drop him a message to apologize for not answering his question about a month ago um, about have I read Robert Graves' The White Goddess? No, I haven't, but it is on my reading list, and I will get to it eventually. Um we can read all the books that we want. I mean, for me, with oh, uh, oh, now that's an interesting question. Now that's an interesting question. I will always go back to my favourite two, which don't. If you look in the literature, don't talk about shape shifting at all. And actually, I don't actually remember seeing anything about shape shifting. I'm going to have to look again. But yes, for me, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? For me, it's the Priscelli Blue. Yeah, just the Priscelli Blue. Um, it's because of its connections with my history over here, with Stonehenge, with the connections with Wales, with its connection with Merlin. That one is just so full of all that magic that it it, nat it naturally calls me to work in all those ways. Anything magical that one calls me because of all those reasons, because, uh, like I say, of Merlin, because of Stonehenge, because of Wales itself. Um, it, that's how special it is to me. Now, the, the books will tell you ver varying different things about it. As, but as I always try to stress, the books of and literature is is useful as guidance 
but you must always listen to your own intuition when you want to work in a specific way. So if you're guided to you oh uh, if you're guided to work in with a different stone than what you you all the guidebooks are telling you then you should um uh, let me just get this one up uh Priscilla blue indigenous to england your connection yes it, yes that's it exactly it's um but it's difficult now for me it's we have to call it britain because of the connections with scotland and wales now priscilla blue which many of my welsh friends will shout at me if i said it comes from england because it it's at, it's the priscilla mountains in wales they like to you know keep that distinction um so yes but it is that it is that um it is that connection with that in it, because it and that is the only place that it exists in the world and i do have welsh ancestry so i feel very connected with it from that side as well i've got irish ancestry so you know, I've got a, but I do, I do feel very connected with, with the Priscilla Blue because of that, all that history, all that connection. Um, and thank you, Elise, for, for that. That's very kind of you. And thank you for asking. She's doing a lot better. In fact, I'm really quite amazed in how well she is doing again. She does that to me. She throws me into panic mode. And then she just gets better because she can. So there. <laughs> yeah, no, she really is. She's doing extremely well. And yeah, since uh, coming back from my my adventures which i have to admit were very 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 much needed that um and allowing yeah allowing my my family to take over and do what they did um was ultimately what was needed they they there was a big hoo-ha halfway through where i thought i'm going to have to just go home and they said no and blah, blah, blah. but um they they started getting other things in place which which have which has uh helped a great deal so there's uh I've got some helpers coming in a couple of times a day and that kind of thing. And mum likes them. So that's always a good, but that's always a bonus. And so she's a lot happier. Uh, she's moving around better. Um, there's all sorts of really positive effects been, been coming through. She has her up and down days, but she's really doing amazingly well. Um, so what else who have we got have i missed some uh yep uh oh itchy itchy mustache so uh so yeah there you go um have any other any other questions that you would like an attempt at an answer to you know um i'm not sure what else i can tell you about at the moment with the last 10 minutes or so um hmm well i'll ask you a question then next month would you like another story i'm just putting it out there 
Um, I have an idea of which one. Um, oh, what is my connection to Stonehenge? Oh, wrong one. Well, I've got two yeses. Oh, actually, I've got three yeses. Um, okay, my connection to Stonehenge. Well, I, I've been there a number of times and my hmm, I can honestly say that I feel not only do I have that that's not just through the stone of Priscelli blue itself itself it's not just through visiting Stonehenge now when I have over the years that I've been there. I feel a very deep old connection to it, a, you know, spiritual. Um, I, I, that's all I can re a really deep. It's almost as if I knew the place a long, long time ago. That's how I feel. That's where I feel my connection to it is that I was there a long, long time ago in another lifetime. And that's my connection to it. That's how I feel about it. Um, So uh, I hope that helps. I hope that uh, gives you a, a a little bit of a an idea of of, of 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 how I feel about it, how I connect to it. That the the mystery of it, the magic of the place. Um, it's just. I wonder if I can. Um, I don't know if I can find it now. Let's just just have a look. Um, if I can find a, for, uh, there it is. Let's see if I can just bring this up. There's crows everywhere around Stonehenge. They are just amazing, and. There was a, when I was there with Tracy and Jen last year, this is, this is my, one of my favorite pictures of the place. And that just kind of says it all. It's just magic, mad, real magic. It's just an astonishing place. So, uh, the crows were very vocal. They, 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 they were talking to us quite a lot, especially one right at the, right at the beginning of the, um, circuit around, around the stones. It, it, it was very vocal, welcoming everybody. Um, fabulous, just. There are those places that we all have a connection to, that we all see, that we all feel that indescribable magic and mystery and power. That one is is mine. And yes, yes, at least those are crows on the top of the stone. The and that is my place. That is the really that and Tintagel, uh, Tintagel Castle. Um, oh, and Dina Samris. Oh, that was a that was a powerful, powerful place. Um, so you know, all those that area on the on the west coast of of Britain is just full of magic or deep old 
powerful magic wisdom and knowledge it's just astonishing and you've all, i mean i know you've all got places yourselves that that have that um well that's that's definitely mine um if you and Tracy ever go again, you better let me know. Okay, will do. Um, oh, what am I doing? So, anyway, so, anyway, Neshi, I think, I hope that kind of answers your question as to my connection with it. Um, it's just one of those places that you know in your soul, in your it goes beyond your knowledge it's, that is is that connection i'm not sure if i'm explaining it right i'm not sure if you can explain it correctly uh stone hair uh is stonehenge a portal connection to our star seed heritage store so it could well be it could well be. Um, there's there's a lot of science being and archaeological investigation going on around Stonehenge. Well, there are, there has been for years and years and years. Um, and we look and we can read as much of that as we want but when we go there you know that there's more more and more there's so much more i think all i can answer your question to sherry is it could well be but that information might not be given to me, it might be given to you, it might be given to somebody else to, to bring to bring into the world. It wouldn't surprise me if it was. Um, can you use Priscilla with Merlinite? Absolutely. There you go. Does that help? I do all the time um, because uh, Merlinite has got the connection with Merlin, Priscilla Blue the same. So, so yes, ab absolutely you can. Um, I would be careful in a way in how you work in it. Work working with the two together. Be respectful um i know i've spoken of this before as in programming crystals and stones as in don't do that talk to them explain what you're trying to do and if they were ask them if they're willing to help you in in your efforts um don't try programming programming them they really really won't like that especially those two um so but there's no reason why you can't use them together at all no no reason why um um am i running out of time uh what is the time oh yes i am running out of time it's it's uh it's, it's a minute a minute to uh, okay thank you neshi we'll see you next time um I will say, um, see you all soon. Um, if there's anything you want me to talk about next time, put a message in the on the page thing, and I'll try and get back to it. But you know what I'm like. I might need a nudge if you really really want an answer you've got to nudge me or message me or something um and get ready for next month's uh next month's story so 
have a really glorious wild and crazy day everybody and thank you for joining me and we'll see you all next month have a great day everybody bye now bye